and we now know that food is made up of say 30,000 chemicals, it's too much for anyone to, you know, work it out themselves. It means a whole new mindset on how we think about food and how we think of our guts. It's much bigger than we've ever realized and it's much more complex. Welcome everybody back to the Zoe podcast. I'm your host, Jonathan Wolf, co-founder and CEO of Zoe. Our mission is for you to understand how your body responds to food because we each respond differently. As many of you know, for the past four years, we've been carrying out the world's largest study of microbiome and metabolic health. So we have an amazing podcast for you. First off, I want to remind you that you can get 10% off a Zoe membership if you go to joinzoe.com slash podcast. Just go to joinzoe.com to check out how you can take back control of your health and weight today. That is J-O-I-N-Z-O-E dot com forward slash podcast. Our topic for today's podcast is the microbiome. In the last few years, scientists have been discovering that our gut microbiome plays a key role in our health, our energy levels, and even our mental health. This has led to a transformation in how we think about what we should eat to keep ourselves healthy and manage our weight. My own diet has been transformed since we started four years, Zoe, four years ago, and the same is true for my family. In fact, my children all know that what they eat is not just for themselves, but it also feeds those little microbes in their guts that help keep them healthy. I'm therefore incredibly excited to be joined by two of the world's experts on the microbiome, Professor Tim and Dr. Will, to help explain what the microbiome is and also discuss some of the changes that you can make to improve your health, your energy, and your weight. I actually first learned about the microbiome when I was lucky enough to hear Professor Tim Spector give a public lecture about his amazing research. Uh, I was so fascinated, I hunted Tim down, and after a bit of work, I eventually convinced him to create Zoe with myself and my long-term friend, George, so we could bring this science to the world. Tim is one of the top 100 most cited scientists in the world. He's a professor in genetic epidemiology at King's College London and a world expert in the microbiome and nutrition. My second guest is Dr. Will. Dr. Will is a member of Zoe's scientific advisory board, a practicing gastroenterologist, an internationally recognized gut health expert, and the New York Times best-selling author of the book, Fiber Fueled. So I think we're gonna have a fun time together and let's just start at the very beginning with really an overview of the microbiome. What is this microbiome thing? And indeed, what is the difference between microbes and the microbiome? Maybe we can start with you, Tim. Well, microbes are any small bug you need a microscope to see. And there is a whole range of them from bacteria to uh, viruses, to phages, fungi, and other parasites that are larger. So that's the general term, but more than often, we're generally talking about bacteria when most of the things we talk about. And when you put them all together in a community, it's that community of trillions of these microbes that we call the microbiome, a bit like an, an environment, like a sort of ecosystem. So that's, that's what they are, that's what the terminology means when we talk about microbiome. It's the whole group of these guys. So most of us have a thousand species, roughly, and there's lots of different types of them. And there are literally, you know, there's trillions of them, the same number as there are blood cells, uh, or cells in our body, actually. So we, we're part, uh, we're part 50% microbe, 50% human. And why does it matter? Well, uh, because these guys essentially are crucial for our health. We really can't live without them. And they're like chemical factories. So all of them produce thousands of chemicals that get into our bloodstream and absolutely vital for all sorts of processes from digesting our food to controlling our immune system and preventing us getting COVID to sending brain signals to our brain to uh, change our mood, to uh, switch us from being hungry to being full and all kinds of other effects. We're only beginning to understand effects on cancer, effects on all kinds of diseases, dampening inflammation, etc. So it's like we've discovered a whole new exciting organ in our bodies we didn't know existed 10 years ago. Well, does that all make sense to you? 
Yeah, it does. I think it's it's quite fascinating to consider that we could be discovering a new organ in the 21st century. You know, in the United States, literally millions of CAT scans are done per year. And all of a sudden, you know, the CAT scans, we're looking at the actual body, we're seeing everything that's there. And now here we go, and we find something that weighs, we believe, as much as the brain does. And one could make an argument that the gut microbiome is the most important part of human health. In fact, I think that's a lot of what we're going to talk about today. The connections that exist between these gut microbes and really, you know, if you kind of take a step back and think about this, the really critical important parts of human health, digestion, which basically means access to nutrients. Like what is more life-giving than that? We need that. Uh, our immune system, our metabolism, which we're gonna talk about in more detail, the balance of our hormones, our mood, uh, our brain health, even the expression of our genetics, every single one of these things is connected back to these gut microbes. And so it's almost like the centerpiece of human health is the gut microbiome, and yet they're not human. And so that's, it's quite overwhelming in some ways to think about, but it's also very exciting in so many different ways. So, um, so Will and Tim, and you know, I, I, I've had this conversation with you a few times, but I never learned anything about this microbiome when I was at school. And uh, okay, that was 30 years ago. But what I learned about microbes was quite the reverse, right? I learned that microbes are dangerous, that we need to use disinfectants to kill them. And that that's actually one of the great advances of the last 100, you know, 150 years ago when we discovered public health. And antibiotics is like the greatest medical discovery of the, the 20th century. And that's about killing microbes. So you know, help me out to understand how and when did we discover about this microbiome? Like, was it with one of these CAT scans you're, you're talking about, Will? And sort of more broadly, why has gut health suddenly become so trendy? And, you know, 20 years ago, I never heard anything about it. Tim, if it's okay, I'd like to, I'll, I'll go first, then you can jump in and fill out. Um, so it's, it's quite fascinating to think about because, Jonathan, antibiotics were the greatest breakthrough in human health history. There is no intervention that has added more years to our life than that. And I think that really what this is, is we have to go back in time in a way and look at the really short-term history of our understanding of microbes, specifically bacteria, which is that going back just 160, 170 years ago, you get to a period of time where we really didn't know what was causing disease. You know, the plague was ripping through Europe and people didn't know what that was. They didn't know that it was a bacteria. They actually thought it was something called miasma, M-I-A-S-M-A, -A -A, miasma. And if you look at pictures on the internet of miasma, they're quite terrifying. terrifying. It looks like something from Halloween. Like this there's is like a the ghost. toxic fumes, right? Well, that somehow yeah. like we had to cover our you know, mouth with it. You see all this thing, like the pictures in the middle ages with people covering their mouths. Right. It's like, the, it's like you walk by a swamp at night and it looks really creepy and it smells kind of funny and you go, oh my gosh, that must be where the plague is coming from right there. It's just, that has to be it. So it shows you how poor our, our understanding of the way that the world worked and these things that were affecting us was just going back to the time of the civil war. We, we eventually have the discovery that it's these microbes that are behind these diseases. And by the way, at the turn of the 20th century, the top causes of death were not heart disease and cancer. They were all infections. And so this is what was costing people's lives. This was shortening life expectancy dramatically. Suddenly, we have this discovery. Oh, my gosh. This is the problem, right? So let's line them up and let's say this is the problem and this is going to be ultimately the solution that's going to allow us to live in perpetuity like you know to 300 years old and so basically so, so, so a sort of classic did, human being response this is the problem and the answer is we should kill them all that that's sort of we, uh, it really is jonathan you know it's it's kind of an interesting point we always we always tend to have this idea that killing them all is the best idea so and we swing the pendulum too far and we start creating all these different systems some of which are very very good to try to get rid of these microbes, right? So like we're sterilizing our water. Well, that's a great thing in terms of preventing dysentery. Um, but when you start sterilizing everything, when you start sterilizing all of our food, when you over sterilize the home, when you over sterilize your own body, 
we end up in a scenario where we've taken it too far. And when we have liberal use of antibiotics to the point of giving antibiotics without even knowing that the person actually needs to take an antibiotic, we're taking it too far. And now here we are, and we're seeing the, the downstream effect of these choices where we've taken this, you know, sort of um, confrontation with bacteria or with microbes, we've taken this confrontation to an extreme in trying to destroy them. And we've been successful. We have destroyed them. And now we're suffering the consequences of an inadequate microbiome because we need them. We need them for human health. And so, Will, how did, uh, maybe Tim, you, you can jump in here. So this is a story about, it was great to discover antibiotics. You know, we're not saying that any of that is a bad thing. In this journey, when did we first discover that there was this thing called the microbiome and that not all microbes were these sort of harmful pathogens that we, we needed to kill? Well, I guess, you know, when I was a junior doctor that, you know, we always knew that when you did blood cultures or urine cultures, you had these other guys there, which the microbiome doctor, microbiology doctors were not interested in at all. They're just commensal. Commensal means these are normal inhabitants. You know, they're like the indigenous population uh, that were just an annoyance in medicine and uh, got in the way of a good test. And so, that's basically all we learned. I would guess about two lines in my textbooks. Well, as well as all these bugs, you, le you learned all the deadly ones. There are, you know, there are also these things called commensals, which you can ignore. And that was basically, it, you know, in every, every medical school in the world, that was about it. And I think it was only, really, I guess there was a guy called Jeff Gordon who started this whole thing off. Uh, most people never heard of him, you know, 20 years ago when he started doing a few experiments to say, well, actually, keeping some of these guys, they might have a role, actually, in health. Uh, but it, it broke only really about 10 years ago did that become at all mainstream, and people started looking at this and then comparing, say, populations of the average American against the average uh, East African uh, tribe and worked out that these, these East African tribes who hadn't taken, anti hadn't taken the 20 doses of antibiotics before they were 21, you know, that the average American has. Um, they had double the number of, of species that the average American has. And suddenly you realize, well, maybe that's why, or one of the main reasons they don't get heart disease, cancer, diabetes, obesity, because they've got all this extra protection on board that is, is helping them because they've not been, they haven't been wiped out by, uh, you know, processed food diets and antibiotics. So I think that- and, and Tim, tell me a bit about, because you mentioned Jeff Gordon. I remember one of my first, I think Will doesn't know this, but uh, in, in the first sort of six months of Zoe's existence, uh, Tim took me out to St. Louis, Missouri, which was my first time there. And we got um, uh, to meet um, Jeff, uh, which was, you know, for me, really sort of amazing. And he showed us all the mice and everything. Tim, do you want to just explain um, sort of sort of briefly what Jeff did and why that was so important for, um, you know, the story of the microbiome as, as being more than, what did you call it, commensal, which I think means forget about this, there's other more important things to worry about. Yeah, he's the sort of father of microbiome research, really, yeah. uh, and he retrained all the current experts uh, around the globe, particularly in the US. Everyone went through, you know, St. Louis, uh, and basically set up a facility where you had sterile mice, so they were they were brought up in a very artificial scenario, like in spaceships where there were no microbes and vacuums and things. And then they were used as experimental tools to see how, when you added in normal microbes from another mouse into them, how you could um, make them you know, big differences in their physiology. And it was that really that, that made us understand the function of these things. And you could take also, uh, as we did as well in one of our experiments, Took microbes from overweight or obese people and put them into these uh, these sterile mice, and you could make them fatter or the opposite. You could take a skinny person or give them probiotics and make them skinnier. So it really that made it really obvious that these weren't just um, random associations. You could actually manipulate them and get a, a, an effect. 
And, that and Tim, can I just stop you there for a second? Because, you know, for you, that's very matter of fact. But I think, again, this was part of what for me was amazing when I, when I first um, experienced and maybe, you know, Will can emphasize. What you're saying is you take these mice, you put these microbes inside them, right? It's not part of, it's not food. It's actually these living uh, microbes. And actually the microbes that came from people who are really overweight actually made these mice overweight. So somehow you transferred over this thing that wasn't a decision about, you know, I'm, I'm eating too many calories, you know, I have no self-control. It was actually like something physical and living and you actually transferred this weight. Is that, is that correct? That's, that, that's exactly right. And so what, this is the key point. Actually, you can now say that, you know, obesity is an infectious disease because it, it actually follows, <laughs> it follows that if you can, you know, take it from some person's gut and put it in someone else's gut and have that result, it suddenly changes your whole idea about overweight and obesity and just gives you a different mindset. Think, well, you know, if it's infectious, also you must be able to prevent it. And so they also did the same from skinny people and put skinny people's microbes into, into these mice and then overfed them and that protected them. And they also, we did this as well with, with a group at Cornell uh, for, with our twins. We, we just found a group of microbes, these Chris, with funny names like Christmas and Ella, et cetera, and that we found only in skinny people, put them into the mice, overfed them, and they didn't get fat. So suddenly this really is you know, a bit of an aha moment. It says, well, if we can really understand what's going on in those gut microbes, this is a really neat way to uh, help us all uh, get slimmer and healthier. And, and this was... And Jeff Gordon basically invented this system and got it on a sort of industrial scale, which is what you needed to do. And uh, he's still amazing. going. Yeah, and he's doing amazing stuff now, looking at the opposite in, um, in, in, young, in kids in, in famine countries and working out what microbes they're you know, lacking because of poor nutrition. Brilliant. Well. And, they've, and they've, they've reproduced these studies, you know, so many times that it's very clear that this is the way that it works, that, that, you know, when you transfer these microbes into the mice, you can actually control the weight balance of the mouse based upon the microbes. And they've, they've done studies, you know, Tim was alluding to this a little bit, where they take identical humans, identical human twins, but one is obese and one is skinny, and take the microbes from these identical human twins and put them into the mice. And give them the same number of calories, which I think is very important to point out is that these mice, it's not a calories in issue. They're getting the exact same number of calories, but the mouse that gets the obese microbiome becomes obese. The mouse that gets the skinny microbiome becomes skinny. And, you know, just to pick up where uh, Tim was in the conversation of, of understanding the microbiome. So, you know, we became intrigued with this idea, but we did have some limitations about 15 years ago or up until about 15 years ago that we're really restricting our ability. And I think Tim could speak to this even more than I can because he's been a part of these research studies. But you know, to me, there were really two major limitations. One is we really didn't have the computing power to be able to handle the data. The amount of information that exists within like literally a sample of poop is completely absurd. And it overwhelms you know, even modern computers. So we didn't have the computing power until very recently to be able to handle the amount of data that was, that was coming from these gut microbes. And the second part of this is that Tim was alluding to the culture plate. The culture plate is the traditional way of growing microbes. That's what we all were raised on. Well, what do you do if the microbes don't grow on a culture plate? Most of the microbes that exist within the gut microbiome do not exist well in an environment where there is oxygen. And as a result, they will not grow on a culture plate. And so we needed a different way to get access to the information about these specific microbes and understand who they are, what they're about, what they do. We needed a different way to do it because the culture plate was never going to work. And so we invented new technologies, initially 16S uh, RNA testing, and more recently, shotgun meta metagenomics. These are nerdy terms that guys like Tim and I like to talk about, but really what you just need to know is we had a laboratory breakthrough and that made this possible. And, and I think maybe for our listeners, a way to understand is these are different ways of reading the DNA of our microbes, right? So just as we're used to the idea of reading our own DNA, 
or, or you know, in these days of days of COVID, right? We're used to reading the DNA of a virus. This means we now have this technology that allows us to read all the DNA and all the different microbes inside our gut. And I think in a follow-on podcast, I'd love to go really deep in that. But but for now, maybe you know, we can move on to this question around like how deep is this relationship between microbes and humans? So we've just said, wow, these microbes can really have this extraordinary effect, right? It is every time I hear this, I'm still amazed. I'm hearing it again, and it's extraordinary, right? This idea the microbes that go inside us can actually change our metabolism outcome. But like how recent is this? Is this something that has just happened between human beings and microbes over the last few hundred years as we're now in this you know, strange new world where you know, I get my food you know, delivered pre-made and uh, you know, I get my grocery uh, delivered? Or is this something that's been around for, for a long time? How, how, sort of how far back do we, like, do we guess or do we know this goes? And, and millions, of year, millions of years, John. Millions of years. Because we actually evolved from microbes and so they're our ancestors. So basically a couple of these microbes fused together and that in a way became the sort of cell, the multi, the multi cell that is human life. And so we've basically spent all of our existence uh, in a way surrounded by microbes and they became part of us as they are part of every animal and every plant. And so in a way, our evolution was formed around these guys and they're an integral part of us. So in a way, what we were saying about, you know, how they are core to us and we've been trying to wipe them out, that our, our evolution has been de totally dependent on, on them being around to perform the functions that we couldn't do, to produce the vitamins that we can't produce ourselves, for example. Uh, to break down the foods that we can't break down. Uh, and every animal has their own tricks. And we, that's why we've got uh, our own set of microbes really to, to do this for us. So you can't separate us uh, from our microbes. We are, we are exact, exactly, uh, you know, symbiotic with them. The, you know, every single person through human history, going all the way back to the very first human, this relationship was a part of the story. These microbes have predated humans by a mile. Uh, we humans have been around, we believe, for about 3 million years, which sounds like a lot. However, if you look at archaea, they've discovered archaea in an archaeologic dig in Greenland that they believe are 4 billion years old. Archaea are a part of the human microbiome. Archaea are also found inside of volcanoes and at the bottom of rift vents inside the ocean. These microbes are hardy, they are resi resilient, they will continue to be around in perpetuity, and really they're just sort of the, they, they are what this planet is made up of, microbes. Yeah. It's, it's brilliant. It's a brilliant, you know, new way to think about the world and the world um, around you. Uh, I think for today, you know, let's narrow down now and talk really about like the gut microbiome, because I think um, scientists have now discovered, uh, I know that there are microbiomes for our skin and for our mouth. And obviously there are all of these microbes that are out there in the environment around us. And I think we can come and talk about uh, those also to, in a future day. But today let's talk about the gut microbiome. And I think that's because the general view is that this is the, the biggest and, and most important. Um, can you can you talk a bit, maybe let's start with like, what's the gut is for? So again, going back to like when I was at school, I was told like, you know, you, you get to the gut and it's sort of like this big sack at the end, you've sort of absorbed everything important by then. And then it basically your food sits around for a day or something and you suck water out of it and then that's done. And fiber was like this thing that just helped you to like pass a bowel movement. Like that was a story that I was told when I was at school. And to be honest, I think it was still the story that I was being told, um, you know, 15 years ago. What of that, you know, what of that story, you know, is wrong or, or what's missing based upon what we what we now know? Well, you know, I, I guess I'll, I'll go first as a and you can say it's all wrong, Will, right? But go on, tell us what tell us what's right. <laughs> uh, yeah, you, you know, I think I think we have dismissed uh, human digestion as as being you know less appealing or sexy. Um, you know, I guess because it involves the passage of uh, of excrement or or our stool. And so as a result of that, it's easy to make jokes about it and pretend like it's not very important when in fact, uh, I would make an argument that this is, this is key to life. This is really where human health begins is with digestion. 
and access to nutrients. So, you know, just to kind of speak to this, Jonathan, you mentioned that there's microbes in our mouth, there's microbes on our skin, there's microbes inside a woman's vagina. Basically, all external surfaces have microbes. Our inside, meaning our intestine, is actually, believe it or not, this is kind of weird, but I'm going to say it, it's outside our body. Because it's a tube that starts at the top and ends at the bottom. And that tube is completely intact all the way through. And so these microbes that are in the depths of our bowels, inside our colon are actually outside our body. Food that we put into our mouth and swallow down is outside of our body. We are interacting with the outside world in this location. And digestion, the gut, when we, when we speak of the gut, by the way, sometimes we're casual and we're talking about the gut microbiome when we should really say the gut microbiome, but the gut itself is our digestive apparatus. And it takes these things from the outside world and it breaks them down into their constituent parts and it prepares them to be absorbed and integrated into the human body. And the parts that are unnecessary are passed on and they are eliminated. And that is not just a human process. In fact, these gut microbes are incredibly important to this entire process. And the reason why these gut microbes have become so critically important to human digestion, going back to evolution just for a quick moment, is that humans started in Africa and then we radiated out across this planet into different ecosystems with different food supplies. And we needed a, digest a, a digestive capacity that was adaptable to all of these different ecosystems and food supplies. Microbes are very adaptable, humans are not. And so we basically allowed these microbes to take over a critical part of our digestion, breaking down our food, giving us access to nutrients, because no matter what ecosystem you go into, you can get the microbes that you need to be able to digest and process the food that exists within that ecosystem. I'll let Tim, any thoughts that you have, Tim? Well, that's right. And the, and the great example is uh, people who like sushi. Um, the Japanese didn't have the, the, uh, the microbes to break down seaweed, but if you eat enough fish, they, the fish eat algae that have these microbes, and you can actually gain these microbes that allow you then to uh, digest and get all the nutrients from, from the seaweed in sushi. So we, we can go around picking up these little uh, microbes and add to our menu, if you like, of all the things that we can get nutrition from. So that's just a great example of why we want a diverse, healthy microbiome. And the more microbes we've got as a toolkit, the better we can survive in any environment and the more we can maximize in a way the, the nutrition that's available to us. And so that, that's got to be a general so, rule. Think about. And Tim, one of the things I think I remember Jeff Gordon saying, um, you know, to me was you could sort of think of your, the way he thinks about your gut actually is basically it's this big storage space where you can store all of these different bacteria. And it's like this amazing toolkit with thousands of different microbes. Each of one is, is like a specialist um, tool for breaking down something. And therefore, instead of needing to have all that capability built into your DNA, you have all of these microbes, which he said, how many more times DNA do the microbes have than, than us? Well, the number keeps changing. It's at least 300 times more uh, genes than, they, than, they, than we have. So, uh, and that's, you know, but you only have to look in the gut, you know, there's 20 odd sort of human gut hormones and thousands of microbial ones. So you know, all is a magnitude bigger, much more subtlety. So we rely on this whole system really to, yeah, to allow, enable us to eat properly, maximally wherever we are. And we can pick up new tools on the way. So unlike our genes, we can pick up these new guys and, uh, you pick them up from the environment, then as long as you keep feeding them, like a you know, uh, like a plant, you can uh, you can nurture them and have them ready. You need them. I think and I think there's something quite magical about this, right? Because I think I certainly grew up um, with this idea that you know your genes are completely deterministic. You're like 
you got given your genes by your parents. There's nothing you can do about it. The only other thing that might shape you is like your upbringing. And if you grew up with your parents, well, they shape that as well. So like you're done, you have no control. It's like, it's very uh, disempowering. And I think there's something really magical for us, for me very much so, this idea that actually you've got all of these microbes, they offer you all of this capability. So it's not like you're totally locked into this restriction of what you feel. But also, and I think maybe we could talk about that um, now, these microbes aren't completely fixed either, right? So there's not like you've got the microbes today and there's nothing you can do to, to change the microbes. Could we talk about that for, for a minute? And that's very important for us to think about, like, to what extent can we, you've told us how important this is, we're sold. Like, is there anything we can do to change our microbiome? If maybe, you know, we, we are like some of the examples you've talked about that maybe we suspect our microbiome is not you know, as, as, as good, as diverse as we, as we would have liked it to be. Yeah, I'll just start and then maybe Will can uh, add some more detail, but uh, our, our microbiome is made up of a, a fixed portion that is like our fingerprint, okay? So there's perhaps a third of it that wherever we go in the world, people know where we've been, right? So they'll, in the future, have these devices that can just pick it off, the, you know, our clothing or whatever. They'll know it's, it's you know, where Will or Tim has, or Jonathan have been, um, because we, we all have a unique set of gut microbes that no one else has. Um, so that stays relatively fixed. Then you've got some day-to-day -day ones that will, will vary, you know, very much all the time. Then you've got perhaps another third that vary with what you're eating. And um, we're still understanding which ones are which and how you change it, but lots of these studies now show that within a few days, you can change very rapidly the microbes if you uh, change your diet. And just as an example, when I was visiting the Hadza tribe in, in Tanzania, uh, within four days, I increased my diversity of my microbes by 40%. And Tim, and what is diversity? What, is that? what does diversity, diversity mean? It's the number of different species. It's the, the richness, uh, but yeah, basically the quantity of different types of microbe I had. So suddenly so you picked up a huge number of new microbes in just a few days. Yeah. By the time I got on the plane on airplane food back to London, you know, I, I started to lose them all. But it just shows you how quickly you can change it because, you know, they they live fast and die young microbes. They, you know, they can, you know, they can reproduce and die in half an hour. Uh, and I think that's what I realized that it's it, you know, much faster life than uh, but even Will has, I think. <laughs> so you... It's, it's, it's uh, first of all, Tim, I think that you need to publish that as a case report. That, that would be a good publication for people to check out. Um, In my book, I should say, so you know, that's a, if anyone wants to, that's the real publication. You know, just, just picking up where Tim left off, uh, these microbes turning over every 20 to 30 minutes, it, it, it's quite fascinating to imagine that like literally within an hour, it could be as many generations as you have living in your family right now, right? And if you were to take this and look at this, each one as a generation and like make it similar to human years, one day, 24 hours would be the equivalent in human evolution of us going all the way back to the pyramids. That's how far these microbes can go in 24 hours in terms of their ability to procreate. And so basically every single one of our choices starts to be amplified through their ability to rapidly procreate immediately. And they've actually shown, and this is um, coming from one of my favorite studies from a few years ago, one of the first microbiome studies that got me really excited was Lawrence David published in Nature in 2014, where they tested the microbiome every single day and they made radical dietary changes and they saw in just 24 hours there were already appreciable differences that existed within these microbes. Now, I do think it's important for people to understand that in, th that's not to say that in 24 hours, you can heal your gut and transform it from something that's unwell to something that's perfectly well in just 24 hours. What, what really I'm saying is that in 24 hours, you can change your gut and get things moving in the right direction. And ultimately what we want is we want the functional capacity of the gut. So the, the, these enzymes and the things that these gut microbes are capable of producing, we want to maximize that functional capacity. That type of change takes longer than 24 hours, but you can get the ball in motion 
in just 24 hours. And so it's a beautiful thing. Your gut microbes forgive you. Whatever you've done, they forgive you. You can have them back. That's very exciting. So let's, I, I think we've touched on a little bit and let, let, let's sort of go fully into it. This, this question about how these microbes are actually connected to our health. So we talked now about this background. We've been living them with them for forever. In fact, I think we evolved from them apparently. Um, how do they affect our, um, our health and what are all the different aspects of health that they, um, that they do affect? Maybe start with Tim. Well, it, it's pretty hard. It really is hard to find anything they don't affect. I mean, I think in a way, uh, because all, this, all the sort of clinical epidemiological studies that have looked at all the common chronic diseases uh, or disorders, so everything from, you know, Alzheimer's, dementia, strokes, heart disease, uh, overweight, obesity, diabetes, depression, anxiety, uh, inflammatory disease, autoimmune diseases, uh, generalized aging, um, uh, and you know, obviously gut infections and even things like skin infections. Uh, when they test the gut microbes of, the, of people who are affected, they are unanimously lower in, in diversity and, and uh, sicker than healthy controls. So you feel that they are playing a role in virtually all the conditions and diseases that we know about uh, or, we've, or we've tested. Now, some of that might be a consequence of the condition, but it's also likely to also be a cause. So um, it's a two-way process that, that microbes are involved. And so if... if, if and, and Tim, can you talk for a minute just to help us understand how? So we've got these microbes, they're sitting in our gut, food's coming in, but I think, you know, I think we're missing the logical linkage. Can you help well, us understand how these can well, affect our health? We don't entirely know how, let's be honest about this. Um, and a lot of the, the ideas we have are theories, uh, and Will may have uh, a lot of his own theories, but in general, um, a lot of these microbes involved in sickness might be ones that are that like living in an inflammatory scenario. So they love feeding off stress and um, changes in, say, the acidity of the gut or um, these kind of things when, when people are unwell. And so they, they sort of sense someone's weak and that there's a victim there and they come in and they take over and they, they kick out the beneficial guys. And so that means that you have more of these microbes that are producing uh, sort of stress-like substances for the body, uh, speeding up, you know, uh, all, all kinds of these stress molecules, inflammation molecules, making everything a bit on edge. And because they're there, they're stopping the beneficial guys producing their nice relaxing yoga type chemicals on the rest of the system. So it's, it's changing the balance of the community is the way I see this for most of them. It's not about one microbe causing the disease. It's very much about how the community is shifting, just like you would see a, a shift in a healthy rainforest or in soil suddenly that balance has shifted. And we, and we see this with medications, for example. You just have to take a, a, you know, a tablet for gastric reflux, like a proton pump inhibitor, uh, and you see a tiny change in the acidity of uh, the gut, and then suddenly other microbes come in and they will lead you more likely to have infections. So it, they're very subtle changes that end up having sort of bigger and bigger effects is how I see it. But I'd love to hear what Will's idea is because I think, you know, we don't, we're just starting to understand this and realizing that it's how these guys work together. And suddenly for some reason, they start to produce chemicals that are, that are like, more likely to be harmful to the body than to be beneficial. And it's that, it's that uh, And we'll maybe talk, because I think Tim's given us a good explanation maybe about how this can all go wrong. Let's maybe go on to the positive side here and, and talk about like, what's the positive thing? So I didn't have any microbes, now I have some microbes. Like, 
how can they do anything good? How does it work at all? I mean, I think maybe just, again, not to jump over it, but like you just said that actually my insides are on the outside, right? So my micros <laughs> are inside me, but actually they're not yet inside me. They're still inside the tube. So how does these things that are still inside the tube affect the rest of my body? Yeah, so I think to play off of what Tim was saying, first of all, Tim is alluding to the fact that this is an ecosystem. This is an ecosystem in the same way that Tim was describing the Amazon rainforest, the Great Barrier Reef, the soil, all right? Ecosystems thrive on harmony and balance. Your body thrives on harmony and balance. Harmony and balance within the community of microbes. Harmony and balance in the interactions between you, your microbes, and your environment, which includes your dietary choices. So, and, you know, with regard to some of what Tim's alluding to, just to unpack a little bit more, Tim's alluding to a loss of balance, a loss of harmony, less good guys, more bad guys, disruption of the gut barrier, the release of things into the bloodstream. This is what we call dysbiosis. This is the opposite of what we're trying to achieve. Now, a quick point, this is a side note that I think is kind of interesting. Tim was describing how stress has these effects on the gut right? Some of this has evolved because it was good for us at a different time. When we are in times of stress, for example, deprivation, deprivation of a food source, it would be advantageous for us to trap calories that would extend our life expectancy. It would be advantageous for us to raise our blood sugar, meaning like diabetes, because we need that to support our big brain. So many of these things we evolved, but the problem is you put them into the context of the 21st century. And now the things that we evolved to protect us when we were cavemen are actually harming us in the 21st century world that we live in. And so now how do we, how do we restore balance? How do we restore harmony? We're looking at this as an ecosystem. We want that balance and harmony and balance and harmony, what we find in all ecosystems comes from biodiversity. Biodiversity means that all the different parties are represented and they work together as a team, the good guys and the bad guys. They all bring different skills into the equation and those skills contribute to the greater good of the ecosystem. So how do we achieve biodiversity? There's a number of different ways. It's not just exclusively food, but we're going to tend to focus on food because we believe that that is the most powerful way that you can affect and alter the gut microbiome. Biodiversity comes from recognizing that these microbes, they are unique individuals. They have their own personalities. They have their own skill sets and they have their own dietary preferences. They are picky eaters. They all don't love the same food. They all don't want kale. But many of them, the best microbes in many cases, they love fiber. Fiber is the preferred fuel source of these microbes. Not all fiber is created the same. That's a bit of a fallacy that we've been taught. Each plant has fiber. Each fiber, each plant has its own unique types of fiber. When we eat a wide variety of plants, we are consuming a wide variety of different types of fiber. Those different types of fiber will feed a wide variety of different types of microbes. The end result is that biodiversity on the plate translates into biodiversity within the gut microbiome. And this is a principle that many of us believe uh, to be one of the critical pieces in terms of enhancing the health of these microbes. And I think the follow on piece, as I understand it from, from, from some of the other scientists we talk about is that these diversity of microbes also lead to the output of this really you know, huge diversity of chemicals that come out of these microbes and cross the gut wall and go through the rest of our, our body. Is that the sort of the, the final sort of missing piece um, that sort of helps to explain like how they, they, you know, we don't understand exactly what all of these do, but could, could you just, just, you know, make, I, I think we, I don't want us to skip over that and make sure that uh, we sort of we haven't missed a, a sort of key logical step here. Yeah, um, I think coming back to my, description of the microbes as chemical factories. I think it, it, it brings this round full circle back to that idea that that's the best way I think of thinking of them because in the future, we're probably gonna be measuring the all the chemicals to work out what the functions are doing. Because often you have 
you know, maybe 20 microbes all working together to produce one key chemical that, you know, lights up your brain and, and stops you getting depression uh, that we don't yet understand. And, 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 the, and we now know that food is made up of, say, 30,000 chemicals, not just fats, proteins, uh, sugars. Uh, and so knowing that we've got all these circulating chemicals from the microbes, thousands and thousands of them, combining with the thousands of chemicals in food to produce these new ones that interact with our genes, interact with our bodies, interact with our immune system, suddenly we've got this amazing ecosystem that's incredibly complicated. And it comes back to this whole idea of why, you know, we can only do this now because we've got this amazing technology to put it all together. But it, it's too much for anyone to, you know, work it out themselves. Uh, we, we, we need to be using this, this big data approach to understand food. But it, it means a whole new mindset on how we think about food and how we think of our guts. It's much bigger than we've ever realized, and it's much more complex. Opportunity. This is this is a great this this is the way that we need to move with our science, which is to accept and acknowledge that every single person there, there are eight billion people on this planet. No two of them are the same in terms of their gut microbiome. There is a unique bio individuality that every single person has, and we need to accept and acknowledge that creating broad strokes in terms of our recommendations is never going to be as good as the granular detail that we have the ability to potentially provide by examining the gut microbiome in the context of everything else that's happening throughout the body. And that's, by the way, a big part of what we're looking to do with Zoe is to introduce this using science, introduce this new generation of being able to not just understand how to eat, but to understand how to eat for your unique biology. And I think that's obviously incredibly important and exciting. I think one of the things um, just sort of following on from Tim's description of like, did you say 30,000 different chemicals in our food is, um, you know, I certainly came from, from this a little while ago thinking about, oh, well, there's a small number of vitamins, right? That you need to make sure that you eat. And there's some specific things like, for example, well, you need to eat a banana because it's got potassium in it. Okay. So like, there's like 10 things you need to worry about. And then there's 15. I think what, you know, I've taken away from, from these conversations with you and others is that there's this immense number of chemicals out there in the foods that we naturally would eat. But more importantly, they're just like the input into your factories, right? Which then output all of these other chemicals that we can't get naturally and which we at this point still are just starting to scratch the surface on. But it seems as though like a big part of why the microbiome seems to have this impact. And I think there are specific papers, right? Tim and Will looking at particular outputs from these, um, from these microbes, which we can see you know, cross the, um, uh, the gut barrier, go into our, our bloodstream, get distributed everywhere. And, and suddenly you start to see much better why you know, the food we eat really does have this impact on our health, which I think is very hard to understand if it's just calories, but starts to make a lot more sense if you think about this huge breadth. It's almost like we are taking medicine in some sense, right? These microbes are creating specific chemicals which are then acting on us. Yeah, and it's, it's realizing that food is, you know, is medicine because it's all chemistry, you know, and it's just a question of definition. And so, you know, we all need to become our own pharmacists and understand much more about food we put into our mouth because it has a, a key effect on our gut microbes. And I guess that's part of this educational mission is if you understand your gut microbes, you have to understand more about the food that you're eating in order to look after them just like any park keeper or zookeeper or you know uh, anyone who's in charge of tropical fish you've got to know exactly uh, what the species are and what you you know what you're trying to do to, to to maximize their health and so that's what we all need to become really we can't be reliant on one size fits all guidelines or supermarket labels or this kind of stuff we need to really get in in deep educate people about personalization and so and let's just, say for this audience, let's say for this audience, we they say like, this is all great. I'd like to take away something practical today. Like that's super interesting, but like, what can I actually do if I want to improve my health? I want to improve my energy. You know, I want to improve my weight. Let's say they want to start that journey today. What are, what are the practical things that they can do based upon all this? Stuff? Four rules people can follow. Um, one, uh, try and eat 30 different plants a week. And that includes nuts, seeds and herbs. 
Uh, second is to pick foods that are high in these chemicals that are defense chemicals called polyphenols that give them their bright colors. And this is includes uh, nuts, seeds, berries, uh, dark chocolate, coffee, uh, even red wine. A third is try some fermented foods every day, a small amount of one of the fermented foods, uh, really important just to boost your, your gut microbes. And fourth, avoid ultra processed foods. And if you do that, you are halfway there to uh, having a really good gut microbiome. And uh, I get Will can talk about other things and personalization. Yeah, I feel so. A couple things to play off of there. One thing, the polyphenols that you just mentioned. Polyphenols, increasingly, there is a body of evidence that polyphenols are not active without coming into contact with our gut microbes. And having the gut microbes to activate them is actually a part of what makes the polyphenols beneficial to our health. Um, so that's just a tangible example of why they're so important. So you, you mentioned many of the dietary approaches that can be taken. And, you know, at the end of the day, no matter who you are, no matter what dietary pattern you follow, what Tim just said, those are simple rules that anyone can apply. There are many different versions of a healthy diet, but those rules can be applied to virtually all of them to enhance your health and to enhance the health of your microbiome. From my perspective, what I would add, you don't need to only change your diet to enhance the health of your gut microbiome. There are ways to improve the health of your microbiome without even lifting a fork. You can get a good night's rest. You can go to bed earlier. You can time with your circadian biology, which means not eating dinner at 10 o'clock at night, eating an earlier dinner, earlier bedtime, fasting before dinner, and extending the fast into the next day. So fasting is an example of something you can do without eating food that can be beneficial to the gut microbes. Exercise is important. The people that you surround yourself with, there's evidence that the people that live in your home, you share microbes together. There's evidence that when you're in a loving relationship, it's good for your gut microbiome. There's evidence that when you have a pet, it's good for your gut microbiome. So spend time outdoors, exercise, tell the people that you love that you love them, have a strategy for maintaining your stress, get some sleep, have an early dinner and an early bedtime. And I guess something that's been hard in these COVID times, which is don't wash your hands as carefully as you might've done before when you're in the outside. Is that what you're both saying with your head, sir, and, and, and pet story? Yeah, you may wash your hands in the supermarket, but make sure that when you're out in the woods playing, you know, uh, or playing with the pets, uh, you perhaps don't wash as much as you, you, uh, you would have been expected to. So. It's a story that the, the bugs that other people are carrying may be quite dangerous for you and the bugs in the environment in general are quite safe. This is sort of one of the, the takeaways from this, isn't it? I think, I think it's about balance. I think it's about balance that, it, that at the end of the day, we don't need to swing the pendulum back and forth and drive ourselves crazy. Oh, this is too much sterilization. This is not enough sterilization. Uh, I think it's, it's more so that, um, you know, there are common sense moments in time where you should be washing your hands. You probably don't need me to define what those are. And then there are moments where we're taking it too far, where we're using the, um, the antiseptic hand, you know, hand rubs and whatnot and using that repeatedly. And it's too much sterilization. It's not necessarily a good thing. That, that makes sense. It's a discussion I have a lot with my wife, with um, particularly our youngest one about uh, clearly we're in COVID. You want to be very conscious of that. But actually, we are, we're brought up uh, now with this idea you want to sterilize everything that, you know, a small child, you know, baby is in contact with. And actually, I think um, clearly that's this is part of this natural process where they're exposed to to the environment. And, uh, you know, coming back to that early point, uh, there are a lot of these uh, these bugs. That, that we need to have. So there's something about finding that middle ground. That, that's, that's fascinating. And one final question on this before we move on, you know, what about probiotics? So this all sounds like a lot of hard work, right? You're saying that people should go to sleep early. That's boring. You know, uh, at least Tim allows us to have a glass of wine. That's nice. Um, we've got to really worry about our food. What about if we just skip all of that and we go to the grocery store and we, we buy one of these um, bottle of probiotic pills that say they have microbes inside them. Couldn't we just do that and, and skip the rest of this and uh, head over to, uh, to McDonald's afterwards? Um, 
you could do that, uh, but I, I think Will and I are both big believers in real, real food first, and there are plenty of foods that have probiotics in them. So, and if you do that, you're going to get a wider range of microbes that is going to be more likely to suit you. And so that's what uh, I would always try first. Uh, you've got yogurt, which has usually two or three microbes. Then you can move to things like uh, some ch blue cheeses, which have four or five or six. Then you've got uh, kefirs, which are fermented milks, which have um, at least 10 to 15 different types of microbe. And then you've got kombuchas and kimchi and kraut, which have even more. So I think it's trying those first and then uh, only really going for probiotics if you are, are sick or have a particular problem. That's where the evidence is strongest. There's not much evidence that probiotics bought at a store will prevent uh, illnesses at the moment. But there is uh, increasing evidence that they do work for a number of uh, mild complaints. And so there's definitely evidence they work. What we don't know is which ones work in which people. Uh, because as Will said, we're totally unique in our gut microbes. So matching the particular microbe to our own thousand species is going to be a bit of luck. And that's why and, and, uh, this is an area for a lot of interest for us, obviously, because, you know, yeah. So if we know, so in the future, we're probably going to end up once you've had your microbiome sequence with individualized advice about which probiotics are likely to work for you. And that's definitely the future of this area. Yeah, I think speaking as a gastroenterologist, I, I would say that there, there is a role for probiotics. Um, I use them routinely, routinely in my clinic with benefit, but the fallacy or the mistake that people will make is when they lean into the probiotic without thinking that anything else needs to change. Diet and lifestyle is the great opportunity. You know, Tim said that when he changed his diet when he was in East Africa, he saw his microbiome diversity radically change in just four days. And you're not going to get that kind of result from a probiotic by itself. But a probiotic is a supplement that can be used in addition to diet and lifestyle changes, particularly for people that have digestive issues and, and certainly provide benefit for many people. And, you know, the one thing I just want to add on real quick to what Tim said that I, I find to be fascinating is the idea of living food. We have sterilized our food supply and there is increasing concern that this sterile food supply is problematic for our gut microbiome. And there's now a call among some scientists to focus on getting more living food into our diet. Now, Tim speaks to the different types of fermented foods. When you ferment, you are creating an ecosystem and then you consume from that ecosystem and transfer it into yours and they come into contact. And we have actually multiple studies showing that the microbes that are in your ferment will show up in your stool. And so that means that they are surviving and getting through. Um, but in addition to that, it's not just fermented food. It's also real food, whole food, food that is still alive. Tim mentioned very early in the episode that these microbes are everywhere, that a plant has its own microbiome. They've studied this in some plants. If you take an apple, an apple has 100 million microbes in its microbiome, more than a thousand species. You don't need to ferment the apple. The apple already has microbes. And so eating real food, in some cases, some raw food can also potentially bring some of those microbes into our, into our diet. And don't smash it up too much before you eat it if you want to get the full benefit for your microbes. So, so we've had a wonderful tour of the microbiome here, and uh, I think so much opportunity to dig in more in, in future episodes. Uh, now let's talk about the role of Zoe in all of this, maybe just to sort of wrap up. So for the last four years, uh, we've been carrying out the world's largest study of microbiome and metabolic health. Maybe Will, you joined our scientific advisory board earlier this year. Do you want to explain, you know, why? Sure. So. Uh... I started as a fan. I was a fan of Zoe. Uh, it was in June of 2020, I saw uh, at a meeting, an international nutrition conference, new research being published by Zoe, by the scientists who were affiliated with Zoe. 
And then shortly thereafter, there was a paper that was published in literally the most prestigious medical journal on the planet, Nature Medicine. And I saw this and I was like, okay, whoa, this is how it was, this is how it is supposed to be done. We are introducing the era of personalized nutrition, but we're not winging it. We're not just making stuff up. This is, this is about doubling down on research and using those tools, the science, to guide us in the choices and our ability to understand how we are unique as an individual and how those unique elements connect to our food choices and how our body interprets those food choices. So what I love about Zoe, uh, what got me really excited is that not to um, uh, be too glowing with you guys right here in front of us, but uh, I'm loving I, it. You can keep going. Well, <laughs> I, well, I just, I just, I just really loved. It. I have to be totally honest. We we live in a society, okay. So if I am if I am Jonathan Wolf, and I am the CEO of a new company, it is a sure thing if I spend my money on a marketing budget, and it is a massive risk to spend my money on a research budget, because the research slows me down. I don't get my product to market. I don't have money coming in. And what if the research says that my product is trash? That would all be problematic. And so what I love is the audacity of Zoe to go out there and you started in what, Jonathan, 2017? Yep. Conducting research, doing the studies and actually showing that what you have is real before you ever opened it up and made it publicly available. And that to me shows a level of integrity that's missing in today's world. And I, I think we all like should appreciate the fact that a company would be willing to do something like that to make sure that the product actually works instead of just rolling out a product, marketing it to you, hyping it up, making you believe that it's real, but not actually having the data to back it up. And so that's what I love about what we're doing with Zoe. We are building something that I think is really special. I think that it is um, going to introduce the era of personalized nutrition in a way that's grounded in actual science. And I also love that each individual person, you can participate in Zoe and you yourself will receive the benefit. I myself have received the benefit of participating in Zoe. I, I wrote the New York Times bestselling book. I've changed my diet since I took the Zoe kit. All right but you yourself can receive the benefit. And on the flip side, there's this concept that is so cool called citizen science, where by participating in the Zoe project, you are contributing to something that's going to help other people. And when thousands and tens of thousands and potentially a hundred thousand different people all contribute to the science, the science gets better and better and better and we advance it and then we can help even more people. And that's a beautiful thing, I love that. Well, Tim was very, I have to say, Tim, Tim was very persuasive that the science was going to work. So uh, it seemed like a good, a good bet. And I think we were convinced we could then do the data science on top of this to sort of decouple this and give people the personalized results if the underlying science was real. And I think uh, I was a little nervous before we got the first results and it was fantastic that it worked out as well as, as, well as it did. Well, look, thank you for your, for your kind words, Will. Maybe because you did do the, um, did the program yourself, maybe you just talk for a minute about like what you get with the Zoe program. So we talked a lot about the microbiome um, in abstract, like could you just help people understand sort of for real where that is today? Um... Yeah, the, the, the thing about personalized nutrition is that, and this is true of so many things in the body, Tim and I have been talking about this for the last hour. It's not just one thing in isolation. It's not just one microbe, it's not just one metabolite. It's this entire system that's complicated and there's different layers and facets to it. So the beauty of the, of the Zoe kit is that it has the state of the art microbiome testing. There is no one with better microbiome testing than what we have. Okay. State of the art there, but it's not just the microbiome. It's also your blood glucose. It's also your blood lipids. It's being able to ac accurately record your dietary choices. It's being able to administer a standardized test so that you can compare my results to Jonathan's results or to your results at home. All right, so when you bring all of these things together, the microbiome, the blood glucose monitor, which by the way is like continuously measuring when you do it, the blood lipids, the standardized food testing, the food app, 
you are creating the complete experience, having the complete data so that you can look at all of these things and the interactions that exist between them, which by the way, we know very clearly there are powerful interactions that exist there. And so, so to be a little more tangible with this, Jonathan, I did my Zoe kit. I paid for it myself back in October of 2020 when I became interested in Zoe and what was going on. This is shortly after it was made available in the United States for the very first time. And um, what you do is basically you spend about one week. The instructions are pretty straightforward and clear. It's not that, it's not that complicated. You eat a couple muffins on certain days. You wear this glucose monitor that is like shockingly easy to apply. And you enter in your information into the food data and, and then you send in a, a stool specimen, which by the way, is like the easiest thing in the world to do. And by doing that, it integrates all of this data. It has machine learning, which are these complicated computer algorithms to basically dissect this and look at the connections that exist that are personalized to you. So like it did it for me. And then you receive basically this information back. And when I open up the app, it gives me my personalized data. And so as an example, there are gut boosters and there are the gut detractors or like the ones that the gut suppressors. All right, so gut boosters are the foods that I should preferentially be gravitating towards. And I can tell that it's personalized to me because they each one of these gut boosters has a certain score. But then when I open the app, the score rapidly recalibrates itself to me. And I can see how that score changes real quick. So anyway, what happened with me is that, look, I, I eat a plant-based diet. I eat plants in variety. That's my big thing. All right. But at the end of the day, like you're not going to eat equal portions of every single plant on the planet. That doesn't, that's not feasible. At the end of the day, you're going to gravitate towards certain dietary choices. What I discovered specific to me is that tofu wasn't as healthy for me personally as perhaps I thought it was. It's not that I avoid tofu. I eat it all the time. But what I did find is that there were specific foods, asparagus, lentils, and avocado that were my sort of supercharged gut boosters. Okay. Specific to me. So what do I do now? I'm eating tons of avocados, tons of asparagus, tons of lentils and times in the past. And well, this is because you're a competitive man, right? And you know, you're going to retest and you want to have made progress and you need to beat Tim's um, gut health score. Yeah. This is, this is really the driving <laughs> factor, isn't it? Let's, let's be honest. <laughs> I mean, I am a type A personality. I can't change that. That's who, that's who I am. <laughs> I can't help that's, that, but... that. That's brilliant. And Tim, where do we, um, you know, wh where does the science go? Because, you know, this is ongoing. So we're talking about the gut boosters and the things we're going like, because there's actually yeah. a lot of work going on right at the moment. Where, where is that going and, and stuff that we hope to release this year? Well, the Zoe Predicts Day is really the first of, of the series, and that, you know, and they were the largest studies of their kind in the world. But we now have five times as much data than we, than we, we first did. And so we're con consistently updating the algorithms as we get more data in from people. And so that's why our precision and our ability to pick um, complex foods and, 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 and different people's diets apart is going to get better and better and better. And so our advice we give back to people is just going to keep growing. So when people go back to this in six months or 12 months time, they'll see that, you know, okay, their microbiome will change, but also, the, the advice will have altered slightly because this isn't static, you know. Um, science doesn't stop, it just keeps evolving and we're, we're gonna make some changes to what we said uh, just six months ago. So I think that's what the, the exciting area we're here. And the more people that participate, just the better, more accurate information everybody gets. And that's what's really cool. And, I, and the more people do this, the better everyone's getting educated about the power of food and the power of the microbiome. Whatever you do, don't take avocados away from me, though. I, I don't care how far the science goes. Don't be taking avocados away from me. <laughs> well, we'll, uh, we'll definitely bear that in mind. And, uh, you know, I think one of the most exciting things for me is, you know, we have these ongoing clinical um, trials looking at the results coming out uh, of people following the advice. And, and the results that we're seeing are, are really exciting in terms of impact on energy, sort of reducing dietary inflammation, you know, weight for a lot of people as well. So I, I think we are we're very excited about what it's doing.
So I think we're at time. So let, let's wrap it up. And, if, and maybe we can lap, wrap it up with just one final thing from each of you. So if there was just one single thing that the listeners can do to improve their gut microbiome beyond doing the Zoe program, what would you have them do? Let's start with you, Tim. Uh, uh, stick to my third, go for 30 plants a week and uh, have that as your, your goal. Even if you don't reach it, just keep a little notepad on the fridge uh, and uh, you know, see how you get on and, uh, you know, and mix it up and try new things. Well, Oh man, Tim, you took it from me. That's my favorite one. <laughs> I literally wrote a book about that. Um, <laughs> so, all right. Well, I, I think I think that Tim's absolutely right in the sense that no matter who you are, no matter what your dietary pattern is, this is a simple thing that you can start to do today, which is to incorporate more varieties of different plants. And so if it's okay, Jonathan, I mean, I'm happy to say other things, but I would just double down on that. No matter who you are, no matter what dietary pattern you follow, it does not matter what it is. The optimal diet for your gut microbiome is a diverse, abundant diet. It is not about restriction. It is about abundance and variety in your diet. Enjoy all the flavors, all the colors. You will be very happy and so will your gut microbes. Fantastic. Well, look, on that note, I just like to remind everybody, if they'd like to learn more about the microbiome or Zoe, then do come to the website, which is joinzoe.com. That's J-O-I-N-Z-O-E. And if you would like to get 10% off your Zoe membership, then just go to joinzoe.com slash podcast, P-O-D-C-A-S-T. I would like to thank our fantastic guests, Tim and Will. I hope you've enjoyed that as much as me. And we look forward in future episodes to digging deeper into different areas we've covered today. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you.